Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video we're going to look at the basics of functions and their graphs. So since this is our first section in our first video of the course, at the beginning of every section and every video we're going to look at a list of learning objectives for the lesson. So it gives you an idea of what we'll be covering in every video in every section. So in this video we're going to look at how do you find the domain and range of a function, exactly what is a function first, determine whether a relation is a function using the definition of a function, determine whether an equation represents a function, and then also use function notation to evaluate a function. In the next video we'll look at the other learning objectives. So let's start off with the idea of a relation, which is the foundation of functions. So in June 2011, that's a few years ago now, Forbes magazine published a list of the highest paid TV celebrities during the previous year, and the results are given in the following bar graph. Now this bar graph might not seem like it's a relation or a function, but it turns out the bar graph has information that describes a mathematical function. So here's how. So notice on the vertical axis, which is the axis that goes up and down. So it's not called the y-axis unless you're actually describing points. So it's just called the vertical axis. This is the earnings of millions of dollars for the highest paid TV celebrities between June 2010 and June 2011. On the horizontal axis, we have the TV celebrities. And we have Oprah, Simon Cowell, Dr. Phil, Ellen DeGeneres, and Ryan Seacrest. So how does this actually describe a relation? Well, a relation is a correspondence or a rule. And the correspondence in this problem is how much did each TV celebrity earn? during the year in millions of dollars. This bar graph actually indicates a relationship between the TV celebrity and the person's earnings in millions of dollars. And it turns out that you can write this relationship as a set of ordered pairs where the TV celebrities are coming from one set and the earnings is coming from the other set of information. So let's get into the definition of a relation. A relation is any set of ordered pairs. It's where the first components in the ordered pair is called the domain. And the set of all second components in the ordered pairs is called the range of the relation. Most of the time in mathematics, the domain is referring to the x values because the x values are always the first coordinate of your ordered pair. And the range refers to the y values, which is always the second coordinate or the second component in your ordered pair. So let's write out what the ordered pairs would be for this bar graph. So keep in mind that an ordered pair is just referring to a point. And in this case, we have TV celebrity is the horizontal axis, so that goes first. And the vertical axis always goes second, and this is the annual earnings for the TV celebrity. So let's write out the ordered pairs. There will be five ordered pairs corresponding to the five TV celebrities and their earnings. So re the relation is a set. So make sure you use set notation, which is curly brackets. And now each celebrity will have its own ordered pair. So ordered pair uses parentheses. Oprah is the first TV celebrity, and she made $315 million. You can leave off million if you like because the units are already in millions. The next TV celebrity was Simon, so another order pair, Simon, and he made 80 million. Third TV celebrity was Dr. Phil, and he also made 80 million. Um, Ellen 
she made 55 million between 2010 and 2011 and then the last is Seacrest and he only made 55 million dollars and then make sure you close curly brackets to say that's the end of the set so these are the five order pairs that correspond to this bar graph that gives us the relationship between the celebrity and their earnings so let's try example one together find the domain and range of the following relation and it's a set of five ordered pairs we have so the domain keep in mind from the definition the domain is the set so use curly brackets for set notation it's the set of all first components so you have 0 is in the first component 10 is 20 30 and then 42 and then curly bracket to close the set when you're using set notation it does not matter which order you put the the numbers in the set the range we found out from the definition is the set of all second components so you have 9.1 I'm going to do 10.7 next 6.7 21.7 and then 13.2 again it does not matter which order you put the numbers that are in the range as long as each of them is listed only once so the note is if a value occurs more than once then you should only list it once So what that means is that if zero occurred more than one time as a first component, you only list it in the set notation one time. Same thing for the range. So one way you can have a relation is with a set of ordered pairs. However, there's a more visual way of representing relations, and it's using what's called an arrow diagram. And we're going to get to arrow diagrams now. So the following example displays the percentage of first year United States college women claiming no religious affiliation after 1970. So let's look at this graph. Notice that the horizontal axis is years after 1970. The vertical axis is the percentage claiming no religious affiliation. And the graph is describing percentage of first year United States college women claiming no religious affiliation. The order pairs are set up as the first component is coming from the horizontal axis, so years after 1970, and the second components are coming from this, the vertical axis, percentage of first year college women. So let's take these five points that are plotted on this graph and actually construct an arrow diagram. So an arrow diagram gives you the domain and the range separated. You have an oval representing the domain and you have another oval that represents the range now the numbers that are in the domain are coming from the first components so 0 10 20 30 and then the last one was 40 years after 1970 and the range again you can put the numbers in any order in any place in this oval it's the set of all second components so 6.7 we had 10.7 9.1, 13.2, and then also 21.2. And these are representing the percentages. So an arrow diagram gives you the correspondence between the domain and the range. Zero corresponded to 9.1. That was zero years after 1970, 9.1% of first-year college women claimed no religious affiliation. So you draw an arrow between that correspondence. Now you do the same thing for the other four points. 10 corresponding to 6.7, and it's okay if you have the arrows overlap or cross each other. 20 corresponds to 10.7, 30 corresponding to 13.2, and then 40 corresponding to 21.2. So you should have exactly five arrows because we had five points. Well, you can also have the relation represented as a set of ordered pairs like we had before. So it's the set of um, 10 and 6.7 that's one point or one ordered pair you also had 0 and 9.1 
we had 20 and 10.7, 30 and 13.2, and then 40 and 21.2. And again, there should be five arrows or five order pairs for this relation. So this gives you an idea of what a relation can be. It's just a correspondence or a rule between two sets of numbers or names. It can be any information. Now we're going to start focusing on functions for the rest of this video. In the previous relation, it was an example of a correspondence between two sets where each member of the domain corresponded to exactly one member of the range. So notice from this previous example, 0 only corresponded to 9.1, no other numbers. 10 only corresponded to 6.7, nothing else. 40 only to 21.2, and so on. So this type of a relation is called a function. So let's look at the definition. A function is a correspondence, or a relation, between the first set, which we know is called the domain, and the second set, which we know is called the range, but it has one special property that makes it a function rather than just a relation. It's where each element in the domain, so every first component, corresponds to exactly one element in the range. So the key idea is that this keyword is exactly one. This distinguishes a relation from a function. Alright, so let's look at example two. We're going to find out what is the domain and range of each of the following relation or relationships and then determine if the relation is a function and be able to explain why. So the first problem you have the set of ordered pairs, and there are four points here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 5, 8. Let's identify the domain and range first. So what numbers are actually in the domain? It should be the set of all first components. So 1, 3, 5, and 5 again, so I don't have to include it more than once, remember? So then the range is the set of all second components. So 2, 4, 6 and 8 are all the second components in the relation. So now, how do you know if this is a function or not? Well, it needs to satisfy the definition. Every element or every number in the domain corresponds to exactly one number or element in the range. So let's make an arrow diagram. We have the domain on the left and the range on the right. The domain, I'm not going to draw the ovals this time, just 1, 3, and 5. And the range has 2, 4, 6, and 8. Well, 1 corresponded to 2, 3 corresponded to 4, 5 corresponds to 6, and 5 also corresponds to 8. So what do you think? Is this a function or not? This is not a function. It's a relation, but it's not a function because... The element 5 corresponds to two different numbers in the range. So the value 5 corresponds to 2 different values in the range. And that's not what the definition of a function is. Function was exactly one element in the range, not any more than that. So let's try the second problem. You have the set of ordered pairs, 0, 0, negative 2, 4, and 2, 4. So again, let's start off with the domain and range, because this is a relation, so it does have a domain and range. You have 0 is a first component, negative 2 is a first component, and 2 is. So that's the domain. The range are the set of all second components. So 0, and then look, 4 appears twice, but you only need to list it once. So now, let's try out the arrow diagram again to find out, is this relation a function? Well, 0, negative 2, and 2 are in the domain, and 0 and 4 
are in the range. 0 corresponds to 0, negative 2 corresponds to 4, and 2 also corresponds to 4. So what do you think this time? Is this relation a function? Does every element in the domain correspond to exactly one element in the range? And the answer is yes. 0 only corresponds to 0. Negative 2 only corresponds to one thing, just 4. And 2 only corresponds to one thing, just 4. It's okay if 4 is used twice. So this is an example of a function. Every element or member of the domain corresponds to exactly one element or member of the range. Alright, let's try the third problem. This time the domain is the set of all actors or actresses and the range is the set of all movies and films. And the correspondence will be if the actor or actress appeared in the movie or film, then you draw an arrow between the actor or actress and the film or movie. Let's say we have the domain are actors or actresses. Let's use Harrison Ford. He appears in several movies. Um, Tom Cruise. Emma Stone. And Ryan Gosling. Alright, so those are our four actors and actresses. The range is the set of all movies or films. So let's use some movies or films that each of these actors or actresses appeared in. So let's use Indiana, Indiana Jones, La La Land, Air Force One, and Star Wars. So let's draw the correspondence between the actor or actress and the movie. Harrison Ford appeared in Indiana Jones. He also was in Air Force One and he was also in Star Wars. So you should automatically know that this is not going to be a function. Harrison Ford does not correspond to just one movie or film. It's corresponding to three different films. So this is not a function. Tom Cruise did not appear in any movie. So that's another problem. Every single element in the domain must be used exactly once. And Tom Cruise is not used as all, at all. So it's not a function again. Emma Stone appeared in La La Land. And so did Ryan Gosling. So let's write out what the domain and range are first. Domain You have Harrison Ford. I'm just going to use the last names. Harrison Ford, Tom Cruise, Emma Stone, and Ryan Gosling. Okay, even though these names appear in the domain, in the arrow diagram, make sure you write them out using set notation. The range is a set of all movies or films. We have Indiana Jones, La La Land, Air Force One and Star Wars. And keep in mind these can be written in any order as long as you have all of them. So now why is this not a function? Let's review. There's a couple reasons. Harrison Ford corresponded to not just one movie or film He's corresponding to three of the ones that are listed. So Harrison Ford corresponded or starred in more than one movie. Okay, that was one reason. 
And the second reason why this might not be a function is Tom Cruise does not correspond to any movie or film. So going back to the definition, every element or every member of the domain must correspond to exactly one member of the range. Harrison Ford does not. He corresponds to three different movies. All right, let's shift our focus onto equations now. We know when an ordered pair will be a function now or an error diagram. Let's start looking at equations. Functions are typically given in terms of equations, not as just ordered pairs. So this equation actually models the percentage of first year college women claiming no religious affiliation as a function of the years after 1970. So it's very similar to the problem that we were looking at before with in terms of the graph and arrow diagram, but this time it's described as a equation. And the equation is y equals 0.012x squared subtract 0.2x plus 8.7. So notice that the x and y are given as the variables. The variable x represents the number of years after 1970. So keep in mind that the year 1980 would be x equals 10 because it's 10 years after 1970. The variable y represents the percentage of first year college women claiming no religious affiliation. So let's try one out. Let's try to find out what is the percentage of first year college women claiming no religious affiliation this year in 2020. So if we use 2020, don't plug in x equals 2020 because x is years after 1970. x would be 50 years because it's 50 years after 1970. So we're plugging in exactly one element or one member from the domain, x equals 50. And if this is a function, we should have only one y value or one element in the range. Let's try to figure it out. So y equals 0.012 times x is 50. So replace the x in the equation with a 50 in parentheses. And that x is being squared. Subtract 0 0.2 times x, again that's 50, plus 8.7. So let's figure out what this would be. 0 0.012 times 50 to the second power. Subtract 0 0.2 times 50, plus 8.7. So according to this equation, the percentage of first year college women claiming no religious affiliation would be 28.7, and that is the percent. So this gives us the y value is 28.7, and that would be 28.7% of first-year college women. So notice that this is a function. We plugged in one x value. We only got exactly one y value as an answer. We didn't get two different percentages, just one. So this gives us an example of what is a function. This equation, y, represents a function of x, and that's how you would read it. y is a function of x, since every value of x, so any year that we chose, we just chose 2020, there will be one and only one value of y, and y was representing a percent. We only got one percent, so these variables x and y come up so often that they have names. The variable x is called the independent variable. The reason why is because you can assign any value that you want to x. And we did that in the last example. We chose 2020, which was x equals 50. We chose that value. And those values are coming from the domain. The variable y is called the dependent variable because the value that we got for y was 28.7 that depended on what value that we plugged in. 
we plug in 50, so we got y equals 28.7. So that's why it's called dependent. Now, we've already seen that not all relations are functions. So that it turns out that not all equations will be functions either. So let's go back to the definition. If we want to know if an equation is a function or not, an equation must be solved for y first. So if it's not solved for y, make sure you get y by itself. If the dependent variable corresponds to more than one y value, then it is not a function. So let's try example three. Determine if these equations are functions or not and explain your reasoning. So number one, you have x squared plus y equals 25. So the first step, you need to solve for y because the y is not isolated. So if you want to get y by itself, subtract x squared on both sides of the equation. And you get 25 subtract x squared. It turns out that this is a function. Every x value from the domain corresponds to exactly one value in the range. So what that means is that if I chose x equals 0, I should only get one y value. If I chose x equals 7, I should only get one y value. Every single x that I choose, I should only get one y value, and I do. Let's try out the second problem, though. You have x squared plus y squared equals 25. Again, y has not been solved for. So let's get y by itself. So again, subtract x squared on both sides of the equation. You get y squared equals 25 minus x squared. And now, it's not y, you have y squared. So you want to have a way of undoing the square part, or canceling out the square. So take the square root on both sides of the equation. So you have square root 25 minus x squared. And because we took the square root, to cancel out a square power, you need to remember the plus or the minus. So now let's test this out. It turns out that this is not a function. You have not just one value of y, you will have two because you have the plus or the minus. That's what makes it not a function. So let's test it. If I choose any x value, I'm going to choose like x equals 4 and I substitute in x equals 4 into my equation, let's see if I get exactly one y value. The y value would be plus or minus square root 25 minus 4 squared, which is plus or minus square root 25 minus 16, which is plus or minus square root of 9, which is plus or minus square root of 9 is 3. So I found one x value, x equals 4, that corresponds to not just y equals 3, it's y equals 3 or y equals negative 3. So this is not a function. The value x equals 4 in the domain corresponds to y equals negative 3 and y equals positive 3 in the range. So if it's a function, it only corresponds to one y value. This x value corresponds to two different y values. So it's kind of like the Harrison Ford problem. You have Harrison Ford corresponding to two different movies. It's not a function. All right, the last topic that we're going to look at in this video is called function notation. So if you know an equation is a function, then you can represent the function using function notation. And functions are given names. So a function is often given a name by a letter, and it can be typically lowercase f, lowercase g, lowercase h, but it also can be capital letters, capital F, capital G, capital H. Like if you have a cost equation, you might want to use capital C for cost. So you can use any letter that you want to name a function. 
But keep in mind that if you have a function, lowercase f, the domain is the set of all first components. Well, they're also called the set of all input values. And the range is a set of all second components, or sometimes people call them the set of all output values. Now, the reason why they might be called input and output values is because a function can be thought of as a machine, where you are inputting the value x into the function, and when you input the value x into this function, now this machine is representing a function, the output value is a y value from the range. So this input, this is coming from the domain, and this is an x value that we choose because it's an independent variable. The output is a y value, or coming from the range. And now, since you only have one y value for this one x value, because it's a function, you can use f of x to represent that y value, like this. y equals f of x, and that's how it's read. f parentheses x parentheses is f of x. Or sometimes people call it f at x. So you input x into the function, this function can be an equation, an error diagram, as we've seen before. It can be a set of ordered pairs. It also can be a graph. So we've seen each of these different types that a function can be. You input one x value, you output one y value from this machine or the function. So this notation, f of x, is called function notation. So it's just an, another way of representing the function is called lowercase f, and you're inputting the variable x, and x is the independent variable. So don't confuse f of x with f times x. So the notation here is not representing multiplication. It represents function notation. So in this next example, example four, we're going to look at what's called function evaluation, where we are inputting specific values of x, and we're going to find out what is the specific value of y. So let f be a function defined as f of x is equal to x squared plus 3x plus 5, and we're going to evaluate the following find f of 2. Now that means the x value is 2 because that's the input value and we're going to find out what is the output when you input 2. So we actually have done this before, this idea. Replace all the x's with 2 and replace them in parentheses. So you have 2 squared plus 3 times 2 plus 5, that's 4 plus 6 plus 5 or 15. Keep in mind that this is a function, so I input x equals 2, I should only expect one answer, y equals 15. So this gives us an ordered pair. First component was 2 for the x, and the output was 15, that's the second component. Alright, let's try another problem. This time we're going to do f evaluated at negative 3, or f at negative 3. So again, take all the x's from the function and replace all the x's with negative 3 in parentheses. It's very important that you include parentheses, especially with the, if you're dealing with negative numbers. So negative 3 in parentheses squared is 9. 3 times negative 3 is negative 9. And then 5, 5. So you get 5. So one input, one output again because this is a function in the ordered pair. is negative 3 comma 5. So this gives you an idea of how to actually input values of x, specific values of x. Now let's input negative x and find out what the output would be. So even though we're inputting not just a number, we're inputting negative x, it works exactly the same way. Your input is the opposite of x. So replace all the x's with negative x because that's your input. First one is squared, plus 
3 times the input is negative x, and then you add 5. Now, make sure you simplify. You will not just get a number for your answer because we're inputting a variable expression. You're going to get a variable expression as your output. So the opposite of x squared, the opposite squared gives you positive x squared, plus 3 times negative x is negative 3x, and then plus 5. This is the output. That's your y value, x squared minus 3x plus 5. All right, a couple more. This time we're going to evaluate the function at x subtract 1. Same function. So again, you replace all the x's with x minus 1 this time. So it was x squared, so x minus 1 is your input squared. Then it was 3 times x, so 3 times the input. x minus 1 goes in parentheses and then you add 5. Now this is going to take a little bit more work. You have x minus 1 squared. That means you have x minus 1 times x minus 1. Let's just keep everything else the same. Now how do you multiply x minus 1 times x minus 1? You have four multiplications to do. So sometimes people call this FOIL. It's just another way of saying distribute. So you have four multiplications. You have x times x, x squared, x times negative 1, that's negative x, negative 1 times x, again negative x, negative 1 times negative 1, 1. Now the 3 is also multiplied by x minus 1, so 3 times x, 3 times x is 3x, and 3 times negative 1 is negative 3, and then the 5 just stays. So this is called the distributive property. So this first one was called FOIL, and this is called the distributive property that we've used. And now after you simplify by removing all the parentheses, combine any like terms. There are no other terms besides 1x squared. You have negative 2x plus 3x, that's 1x. And then you have 1, subtract 3 plus 5, that is 3. So that is your output when you input x minus 1 into the function. Okay, let's try the last one. This time it's very similar, but this time it's x plus h is the input. So again, you have x plus h squared, because it's x squared, so input squared, plus 3 times the input, x plus h, is what you're plugging in, and then you have plus 5. So now, same idea as the last problem, we're going to have to multiply x plus h times x plus h, because it's being squared, so x plus h times x plus h, and you have 3 times x plus h, and then plus 5. So take x times x, you get x squared, x times h, xh, h times x, another xh, and then h times h gives you h squared. So that's called FOIL, because you did four multiplications, first, outer, inner, last. Then you have 3 times x and 3 times h, and then the 5. All right, any like terms? Well, there's no other just x squares. There are xh and another xh, so you have two xh's. You have h squared, no other h squares. No other 3x's. No other h's by themselves. And no other just constant terms, no other just numbers. So this is a, a very long output, but this is the output that you would get if you input x plus h into our function. So this gives you an idea of how to evaluate a function at different input values. And this is a good place to stop our first video. In the next video, we're going to look at how to graph functions. So if you have any questions about any of the examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. I'll see you at the next video when we talk about graphing functions and the vertical line test.